the same God that never failed will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
God wants to help you. He wants to meet you where you're at. He wants to make a way, a path for you to have victory in whatever it is in your life. He's a way maker, man. Sometimes I think, I know myself, I can sing, but do I really believe? This morning I want you to believe that God is a way maker. Jesus made a way. And as we finish out, our time of worship this morning, focus on that, that he's a way maker and that he loves you so much. He has nothing but goodness and mercy for you all the days of your lives. And so, come to the throne room, man. Behold him. Behold who he is. Come to the throne room and worship. Behold his holy son, the lion and the lamb given to us, the one became a man that my soul should know. Let your work in 
you still bring water from the rock to satisfy my thirst to love me at my worst and even when i don't remember you remind me of my word i don't trust my ways i'm trading in my faults i lay down everything because you're all that i want i've landed on my knees this is a cup you have for me and even when don't make sense I'm gonna let your spirit lead 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 that you would just be present in a way that we cannot ignore. We pray, Father, for the words that are coming from our pastor's lips. Father, that we would hear you in them. We pray, Father, that you would just bless our pastor as he comes up to deliver your message. And Father, may we not forget that it's you we're hearing, you we're learning about, and it's you that we love. Thank you for what you're about to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Have a seat, have a seat. Hey, before we get started this morning, I'm really excited to have an incredible ministry that is here with us this morning, the Gideons. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Chances are, if you've been to a motel and there's a Bible in the room, the Gideons got it there. They are an amazing, amazing organization. Uh, they blessed us the other night with this wonderful dinner. Uh, they honored pastors and, and, and church leaders, and it was just an amazing time. And um, uh, we've invited them here this morning because we want you to get a little bit of a taste of what their message is about. Maybe somebody in here would like to be involved. It's an incredible ministry. Um, 
pops here. We used to coach together, D Dave Portugal, him and I. We go way back, man. And uh, uh, I knew him when he was a young guy, like in his 20s. And so, no. <laughs> and then we have John and his wife, Cindy, here visiting us. And so I'd like to invite John Moore up to come and share with us and, and uh, tell us a little bit more about what the Gideons are about. You're welcome. Good morning. Well, I know that I'm in the right place. Uh, what a sweet, sweet spirit that we have here today. Amen. Um, I've told my wife many times about going to the throne room. Music is my passion, and so um, that's what we're talking about, honey, right there. That's, that's how it goes. So, yeah, he, his spirit is wonderful, and we are thankful very much to be here today and tell you a little bit more about the Gideons. I'm a Satanist. I follow the Lord Satan. It's what a young university student yelled at a team of Gideons whenever they were down in the city of Mexico City. He had taken a testament before he saw what was actually in it, that it was actually the Word of God. And he continued to be enraged and shout and rant profanity at all the men. Finally, the students told the Gideons that he would show them just what he thought of their book. <laughs> so he took his cigarette lighter out. And he did his best to set the little testament on fire. These little testaments, yes, my wife is holding them up here, the little testaments. So he tried as he would to get the, the testament to light on fire. <laughs> would not burn. After several minutes, he could not get it to light. Not even the pages, which is a God thing, right? We all know God shows up whenever we need him to show up, right? So the student quieted down and became afraid and... He took off, right? He comes back about 15 minutes later, and he apologized. And he said that <laughs> he realized this must be a supernatural book. <laughs> you think? So, so the men began to witness and share Christ with him. And the back of the cool things about these little testaments are the front section are a, a helps section. And what I tell people a lot of times, I say, well, brother, sister, have you ever had anxiety? Oh, I got anxiety right now. Well, let me show you. And it's like alphabetized where you can look, and it gives you the scripture reference, how you can get help for, in that instance, anxiety. And the back section on the back cover is the plan of salvation, how you can know you're going to heaven, how you can accept Christ Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So as they began to witness, before long, later that morning, like an hour later, he bowed his knee and accepted Christ as Savior, a Satanist. Okay, so I think everybody here, it's, my question would be, if I were in your seat, why are we here? Well, we're here because of Matthew 28. Matthew 28, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you. I like that version, lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. So, Christ is with us. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. So the thing that I love about the Gideons is the fact that we go as we're commanded to, and we can participate together. The greatest thing that we can see in our lives once we know Jesus Christ is to see others turn to Christ. It's the greatest, glorious thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. And I, you know, the things that we all have stories, but once, years ago, I was living in the state of Washington, working at a Safeway. While I was on my way home, I needed gas. I stopped at this little station, just, a, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere. I went and pumped $20, walked in to give the girl the, the money, you know, and she says, well, what's this for? I said, well, it's for the gas I just pumped. Oh, no, you can't get any gas, sir. The pumps are off. How did you get it? I said, well, I took the thing and I squeezed it. <laughs> I, you know, I put it in there. She said, no, they're, they're shut, shut off. I've already shut the, I've shut the pumps off. I said, well, you probably would need to check because I got $20 and I'm here to give you the, the $20. Immediately, how many know God speaks to us when we really sometimes don't expect it? He, he speaks to us when we do expect it. But in this instance, and we had planted, I had planted a little church there and was pastoring and some other things and, and, and doing musical ministry. And, and I, you know, I didn't expect it. I was tired going home this, this evening. It was dark out. 
And I heard that still small voice. How many knows he still has that still small voice? He told, something told me in the back of my mind and my heart, it said, tell her about me. She's ready. I'm like, wait a minute, what? And, I, and you know, it all, all this happens in a split second, like faster than milliseconds. And I thought, I don't even know what to say. And, of course, this wasn't an outward conversation. It just happened instantly. So I, I thought, all of a sudden I heard, just tell her what I did for you. I don't know to this day exactly what I said to this girl. But before I knew it, when I got done talking, she reached across the counter and took my hand and accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. You know, this has nothing to do with me. How many know that this is not us? This is the Lord's ministry. All we can do is be obedient, pray, read his word every day. But I just felt like God wanted me to share that. That wasn't in the script, but that, that's a true story of what happened to me. And just like Pastor said, for many of you, you probably know about the Gideons like I did, about seeing the, the hotel Bible. Maybe, you know, you knew something about prisons and other ministries that we distribute in. But since 1899, the object is to win others for Christ, helping Christian business and professional men strengthen their personal testimony and increase the influence for Christ in their homes, their workplaces, and churches. The one thing that I can tell you after becoming a Gideon is that it's the greatest thing and single resource for any church, pastor, layman, or anybody who lifts the name of Jesus Christ up as Lord and Savior. It's a worldwide ministry. There's no uh, commitment issues. The, the way that they talked to me about it when I started, I thought, gosh, I just got remarried. My, my wife passed away in 2017 in Missouri, and I was a full-time worship leader, and the pastor, when I left to go work in the oil fields, he says to me, well, John, you need to get online. I thought, I'm online every day. What are you talking about? And then it dawned on me. I thought, no, no, no. I don't, I don't want to meet anybody. He said, yeah, give it six or eight months and try eHarmony. And I'm thinking, how in the world do you know this? This is the pastor I'd, the senior pastor I'd served with for ye several years. He goes, well, I'm a good shepherd. And I thought, yeah, he must be. I laughed it off. I thought it was crazy. I thought it was crazy. This is also a testimony of our Lord and Savior. So I go and work in the oil fields. Finally, after 25 years being married and, and very happy, and I hadn't been coming home to an empty home in a long time, right? And so I come home one day, and I thought, well, okay, I'll try. So I got on, I tried, I thought it was nonsense, I was ready to quit. In fact, I had already emailed them or whatever and said, don't charge me again, I don't believe in this, I think it's crazy. Apparently, I'm out there in the oil fields, and they, how many know that, like, in some of these apps, it's like, well, you like the picture, you swipe one way, whatever, right? So it's a game to me. I'm just out there hauling oil, waiting for my oil to load. So apparently, I get this message back, and it's some girl from Madera, California. I'm thinking, where in the world is Madera, California? And she goes, well, thanks so much for the smile. Apparently, whatever I did sent her a smile, whatever that is, right? And so, so she goes, well, she said, uh, I don't see how we'd ever meet in person, but good luck. Thanks. And so I'm standing there thinking, well, gosh, I'm working in the oil fields and my children are grown. My wife passed away. I'm going to Seattle to see my youngest daughter. And I might as well see if I can get a trip into Central California. And it, this is so, you can't make this stuff up. And so, and so we ended up, I called Priceline. They called me back. They said, well, Mr. Moore, um, we've got you in there for Four days and three nights, I'm like, wait a minute, I only need 30 minutes to have coffee. This girl may not even like me, right? And so then I call her. By this time we're talking on the phone, I call her and she says, I got to go. And I thought, oh, no, she thinks that I came up with this, right, as some kind of a ploy. And, of course, how many know all of her friends, especially here in California, are thinking, what kind of guy flies across the country to spend four days and three nights sight unseen, right? So... I'm telling her, no, really, I promise it's not my idea, you know. So we ended up coming to Fresno. And anyway, long story short, she had a friend. She lost her husband in 2015, my wife Cindy. And her girlfriend, who had not been on a date in 19 years, had been divorced. She said, well, 
I want you to go on a date. Well, I'll do it if you do it. So they had a friend help them set up a profile. That's how she got on. Well, her friend never went on a date. God blessed us. We've been married now for two years, both widow and widower. So praise God. He has absolutely shown up big time. And I just felt like that that could be an encouragement for somebody. Um, you know, what we do here, like I said, it's, it's Matthew uh, 28. We're in 200 countries, territories, possessions. We publish scriptures in over 100 languages. And over 70 million copies of God's word were given out worldwide last year. Now, how many know, I mean, the scripture tells us we overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's true. That's in Revelation 20-something. But how many know that it's the word that's sharper than a two-edged sword? It's the word that cuts. It's the word that does the work. Our job, this is something, I didn't know a lot of this until I became a Gideon. The word, getting the word into somebody's hand is, is the thing that changes people's lives. Yes, we facilitate, that's great, but it's getting the word out. So 70 million last year. Um, you might be surprised, some of the places that we go, like in Peru, there was a young man, this is, this is just too rich. Again, you can't make this stuff up. Guillermo Zapata, he was a, an engineering student, and he had gone into the uh, missionary from his church. And the pastor prepared him, and he was sending him into the area of Peru that was known for a stronghold for witches and warlocks and all that kind of stuff. So he puts up a sign when he gets there, mining engineer giving free Bible lessons. I mean, it's a true story. This really happened. And so one day it rained very hard. Nobody, of course, came for their Bible lessons, and he was very despondent, right? And so he went, and went down. It was raining very, very hard. He was trying to get the, the water out of his hut, and a mangy dog runs into his hut and grabs the one testament like Cindy has there in his teeth and ran out, and the guy ran to follow him because he had gotten saved because of this testament. That was his only copy, and he could not catch the dog. So... A couple of weeks later, he gets a knock on his door, and, you know, in the meantime, he had become, you know, very worried about where is, you know, where is his testament, and this warlock, who was like the head of the whole area, came and knocked on his door, and he said, well, I'm not really sure what happened, but I was having a nice day, and this little dog came along and ended up bringing this little book into my hut. And I started to read this thing. Again, it's the word that cuts. I started to read this. This is a, I guess, a, I don't know exactly what denomination of Satanism a warlock is, but it was a bad, bad dude. He didn't believe in the true living God. And so, anyway, again, long story short, it was over the course of a, of a day. He started to tell this guy about it. Not only did this guy bow his knee, the warlock, and accept Christ, he went back and led his entire family family to Christ. So praise God. Give him a hand. Amen. Amen. So one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, what can we do um, in order to help? What can we do? That was my question because I thought I had just gotten married. I just moved here. I was busy. I didn't know. I didn't have any time. Well, brother Jerry, the guy that kind of recruited me, he said, look, there is no real hard and fast thing. You just come. We trust God to bring you when you can be there, and we trust him to bring others when you can't be. I mean, how many know God can, can handle this, right? He, he doesn't need our schedule. So, I mean, I immediately said, I'm in. I'm in 100%. And so when I came and started to do that, it was interesting. One of the first guys that I talked to about joining at, at our church in Madeira, he's like, brother, look, I was a I don't remember if it was the Lions Club or, you know, one of those kind of clubs. He says, they just called me and told me if I don't do X, Y, and Z that I'm out. I said, listen, brother, we believe that God's in charge of this organization. If you can come one time, that's great. If you can come every day, that's great. We have people that are retired, people that are busy, young families. We believe that God can orchestrate that to do it. Because guess what? We are what? We're commanded to go. And so that's the thing that we're able to do. So there's a, there's a couple of different ways that you can help and be part of this ministry. The first and the most important is prayer. How many know that prayer moves mountains? Prayer moves mountains. So we would encourage you to think about praying for us. There's an insert in your um, 
hand out this morning your bulletin. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to tear that out, maybe put that in your Bible, and to think about, you know, praying for us. Because there's people, there's some bad places in this world that we have Gideons reaching the world for Christ. We know there's a mission field right outside this door, right? There, we're, we're in a mission field, but there's also some places that are very dangerous. I have a, I had to look this up, Pastor. First cousin once removed. I figured out that's really what he is. It's my first cousin's son which is my first cousin once removed, he is a, he gave up an Air Force um, officer career to become a full-time missionary, and he's now full-time in Lebanon. And he says it's very, his name is Hunter Harrison, and, you know, it's, we, we support him, and it, it's, it, but that's the kind of thing, and what we're trying to do is, because the Lord said, go ye therefore and reach the world. So that's, that's the first thing is prayer. You know, another thing, if, you know, you can consider, you know, investing in the ministry. Now, for less than a dollar and 20 cents, you can get one of these little testaments that would be sent somewhere in the world where it's needed. Obviously, then 120 would send 100 of these, and they will send them to a place that's desperately needing them. Now, think about this. You know, it doesn't matter how many know that God doesn't really need our money. He, this is a blessing for us to be able to be part of something. And again, we encourage you first and foremost, support your your local church, the church that you attend, support here first. But it also talks about tithes and offerings because the idea of offerings is that you go above and beyond. Like uh, era, I don't know if you heard that, Pastor. He says, well, sometimes it's like exercise (laughs) because sometimes it hurts. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a penny or a million dollars or anywhere in between. This is an opportunity for people that are busy that can't go and do to be part of people who are going and doing. So that's an encouragement. If you can give $1, that's fantastic. If you can give 100000 that's fantastic. We just know that this is an opportunity. And I, Bill Day, the, the guy that's, I'm the vice president of the, of the Madera camp. He's the president. He told me, he said that the, I didn't know this factoid last night, that the, the Gideons, International is the largest, longest-lasting uh, ministry for missions in the world. And so, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to be able to plug into something that's already doing. And again, people are called like he's given pastors, evangelists, teachers. He's given a lot of different people things to do, right? Worship leaders. But he also has given us the opportunity to, to catch the vision and to be part of something that we can do and be part of that doesn't take time, doesn't take a lot of resources. Uh, third, you can also donate scriptures using the Gideon card program. Now, this was something that really broke it down. And again, I'm kind of hard headed. I'm from the South and we just don't cotton to that kind of stuff. It's funny, you know, that I don't talk that way. Maybe it's because I played so much music I never really got the southern drawl like a lot of the guys where I'm from. But the interesting thing is that with the Gideon cards, you can get these. They're very, very nice, and we can bring a display and have it set up out here. They're free to use. <coughs> Excuse me. They Basically, you can do it for anything that you're going to need, whether it's a, you know, in memory of, please get well soon, thank you for participating, they have a bunch of them. They're beautiful cards. They're like a dollar something. How many knows if something happens and you don't have it on hand and Aunt Wilma from somebody in the church passed away, where are you going to? Walmart to get what? A Hallmark. How much is that going to cost you? Probably three to five bucks. Probably. Probably. I don't know. It's different in different places. The point is if you have some of these Gideon cards, the way it works is you give that in memory of you know, Aunt Wilma, Uh, whatever, we're going to give 10 Bibles. And then it gives you a place, you tear it out, you send in the number of dollars for those 10 Bibles, like $12, whatever it is, and you tear that out and you put that in the offering, you know, pastor, we get it to us, or you can mail it directly in. That's another way you can participate and solve a problem of having a card when you need something that needs to be done that you don't have because you're going to have to go buy it at the local drugstore, which is going to cost you more money. Um, And then, of course, uh, fourth, becoming a prayer partner with us as a friend of the Gideons. If you want to be part of what we're doing, you can basically give $10 a month 
you'll get 10 testaments like the one that Cindy has here uh, for personal witnessing, sharing the word of God. And, you know, if you're interested in that, we certainly can, can help you. And of course, the, as pastor said at the beginning, uh, anybody that's interested in <coughs> becoming part of this entity, it's, it's been the greatest single blessing in my Christian walk in many years. It's been 33, four years now since I really got completely, <coughs> excuse me, sold out for Jesus. And the reason is that it allows you to organize with a like-minded group of men and women with the auxiliaries to pray. I mean, we have prayer meeting breakfast every Saturday morning. We have conventions like we just came through um, this past three days. It's just a blessing, and it, it helps because I know you've probably all heard the analogy of the frog in the water. The frog jumps in the water. It's cool. They turn the temperature up. It starts to heat up a little, 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 little. Before you know it, it's boiling, and he doesn't realize it and doesn't jump out. I think that's a, an analogy for human nature. I think sometimes we need something to kind of hold our feet to the fire. We need something that reminds us on a regular basis. And, of course, <clears throat> one of the greatest ways is to read the Word every day when you first wake up. That would be something I know that's changed my life. But if you have interest in that, we would love to talk to you about becoming a Gideon and uh, a Gideon wife would be an auxiliary. And so we just, we thank you, and, and Pastor Dalton, thank you so much for letting us come and share the love with you today, and worship team, oh my God, <coughs> touched us very deeply. Congregation, thank you so much, and if we can do anything to help you, to partner with you, this is a great opportunity, and we'd love to see more of each of you. May God bless you, and I'd just like to pray for this church, Lord. We just lift up this church right now, the refuge, Pastor Dalton, the worship team, all the congregants that are both here and online, Lord. All who lift up the name of Jesus, we pray your richest blessings upon them, Lord. We know that it's about the one. Jesus himself said that the, there was a hundred and the one was lost. He went after the one. Let us go and have the passion to go after that one, Lord. Enrich us, protect us in these dire days, Lord, and give this church the blessing, this pastor, these people here, the blessing and the richness of your Holy Spirit that I felt so, so strongly here today. And we just thank you and we ask this all in the holy and the reverent name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Man, oh man, shoot, I might as well just call it a day. That was some good preaching, boy, let me tell you. <laughs> I ain't even going to lie, man, oh man. <laughs> that was awesome, man. So uh, uh, we're just excited. Thank you again for coming today, man. Thank thanks, thanks, Pops, man. A lot of years together, man. I'm glad to see you. So, um, yeah. Um, so uh, I've been kind of on a joke kick the last couple of weeks. So, I mean, some of them you've been like, and some of you've been like, so joke or no joke today? What do you think? Uh, Joke, joke, okay, all right, all right, so, so I came across this joke, all right, so this little boy, he uh, goes up to his dad, he says, hey, Pops, man, he says, uh, I'm getting old enough, man, I think you need to tell me, like, how this all works, you know, how did, how did we get here? And he's like, all right, I'll tell you, man, he says, so God created the heavens and the earth, he said, then God created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had babies, and they grew up, and they had babies, and they grew up, and pretty soon... After thousands of years, here we are. And the little boy's like, okay, cool, Pop. So he was like, man, I wonder what Mom's going to say. So he goes to Mom. He goes, hey, Mom, how did we get here? Oh, son, that's real easy. We started out as these monkeys. And, <laughs> and, and so we were monkeys, and then through millions of years of evolution, you know, we went from monkeys to becoming what we are today. 
So he goes back. He goes, man, Pops, you lied to me, man. Why did you lie to me? Mom says that we came from monkeys. He says, I was talking, but she's talking about her side of the family. (laughs) Good? I thought that was funny. (laughs) So anyways, um. So this message today, right, we're doing a series called Fellowship for Our Souls, and I've really based it off of our verse-by-verse teaching that we did of Philippians chapter 4, and the last thing that we talked about in chapter 4 of Philippians was the, was the idea of connecting. And so my intent on this series was to, like, talk about connecting over food because, as again, you guys know, I'm a professional eater, so <laughs> food's a good, I like food, right? So... When I started working on this, this message this week, titled Divide or Not to Divide, I was going to bring food into it, right? But God took me in a whole other different direction, man. And so today, this is going to be a tough message, church. It's going to be a tough message, man. And we're going to be challenged. And I know I was challenged in a lot of things. But listen, if we're not challenged in our walk, we're not growing. We need to be challenged, man. You need to be challenged on what you believe, what I believe. And we need to understand that as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, the importance of us being of one mind and one spirit. And I think if there was ever a time when the church is divided, it's right now. The division is unbelievable. How many of you, how many of you would agree that 2020 and 2021 have been a heck of a couple of hard years, right? But we were looking to 2021 after last year and thinking, man, 2021 is going to be great. But we've run into a lot of things, haven't we? If you remember back in mid-March of last year, pretty much the whole world had shut down. This pandemic had started. Businesses were closing. I mean, we were, we were on lockdown, basically. And the tragedy of this pandemic, it just continues. Uh, People have lost loved ones. Um, People have lost their jobs, their businesses, man. I mean, it has been an incredible ride over the last year and a half, almost two years. (coughs) And the bottom line is, is that we've lost a sense of normalcy through all of this. And in some ways, I think that's good. I think the church went to sleep pandemic caused us to wake up again and force ourselves to look at how we're doing things and are we reflecting Matthew 28 right are we really carrying out the great commission and now here's the thing many crises in history right they have a unifying effect December 7th 1941 who knows what that is Pearl Harbor right unifying effect Japanese come in, 8 o'clock in the morning, bomb Pearl Harbor, wipe, I mean, they, 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 get it, they get it on, they get it done. Here's the amazing thing, here's a historical fact, I come from a military family, so it's one of the things that, 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 and you guys are a lot smarter than me, you probably knew this, but here's the thing, here's the miracle even in that, is that two-thirds of our fleet was actually out on an exercise the day that it happened. It could have been much more devastating had the fleet not been out. Only a third of the fleet got wiped out. Two-thirds were out. And man, people were joining the military left and right. How dare you come and strike us? We are coming after you. We're going to the fight. Yesterday, our country remembered 9-11. I was emotional over it, right? Because I'm, I, listen. It was, a, it was a game changer, 9-11 was. Everything in our lives is different because of 9-11. Terrorists fly planes. Two of them go into the tra- World Trade Center towers. Another one hits the Pentagon. A fourth one, they're not sure if it was heading to D.C. It could have been heading to a nuclear. They're not sure. But people who were on the plane, that plane was delayed. This is God, <laughs> believe it or not. That plane was delayed from taking off. The people heard what was going on. And when that plane got commandeered, they said, we're not taking this. We're, gonna, we're going after them. And they kept, 44 people died on that plane, but how many countless lives did they save? Right. <coughs> I 
every one of us can remember where we were at when, that's, when that moment happened. I was at a pastor's conference. And we had gotten up early that morning. And we were supposed to be at a prayer meeting at 6. We got up about 5.30. And one of the guys had music playing. He had a radio on. And this news story breaks that there was a plane that crashed into the towers. And we're like, oh, wow. Must have been a small plane, you know. They talked about that could happen. Pretty soon we found out it wasn't that. Within two hours, something within two hours happened that had never happened before in American history as far as aviation. Within two hours, 5,000 planes were put on the ground. It had never happened. 5,000 flights were grounded within two hours because we did not know what was going on. In fact, I have a video clip to play to kind of remind us of that day. If you were with President Bush on September 11th, you were likely thinking that, yes, this is everything you've been trained to do. Your entire life, you've been training for this one moment where it all goes bad. They had a plan for how we were going to evacuate the president in the event of an emergency that required him to be somewhere else very quickly. At 9.57 a.m., Air Force One hits the runway in a full throttle takeoff. Two F-16 fighter jets join it soon after, providing an outer perimeter of defense. They're loaded with air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles that can take out a target 72 kilometers away, and Gatling guns that fire 6,000 rounds a minute. You need that firepower to act as a deterrent to any potential adversary. We always make sure that we have weapons that can feed the bad guy in any kind of scenario. The Secret Service must keep the president in the air, avoiding Washington until a secure landing zone can be found. But the president must still run the country as if he were in the Oval Office. Air Force One is equipped for the task. Its upper level is dedicated to communications, 238 kilometers of wiring, 85 onboard telephones, 19 television monitors, internet connections, and state-of-the-art signal encryption enable the president and staff to stay in touch anywhere in the world. If needed, the Secret Service can keep the president in the air for days. Air Force One has the capacity to stay aloft for quite a while, it can be refueled from the air. Do you remember that? I remember that. I remember we did not know what was going on, right? There were three planes in the air, Air Force One, two fighter jets. We had jets flying on the perimeters, checking our borders and everything else. Everything else was landed. It was, it was, it was, there was nothing. We were in a state of panic. We did not know what was going to happen. We did not know. We did not know, and it unified this country. Do you remember? I remember going to church, and it was filled with people. Filled with people. People were tripping. Is this the end? What's going on? People were, I mean, it was crazy. Flags everywhere. It changed the mindset of our country. But the pandemic didn't do that. In fact, the pandemic had the exact opposite. It didn't unite, it polarized. It polarized people, man. And today, on September 12th, 2021, we are a nation divided like we haven't been divided in years. And a lot of it stems from this pandemic. Some people agree with wearing the mask. Some people don't agree with wearing the mask. Some people agree with shutting down. Some people don't agree with the shutting down. You know, I remember when we shut down the first time because we wanted to uh, obey the laws of the land, right? We shut down. The church shut down. We did all streaming and everything else, right? The second time, I met with the leadership and we decided we weren't going to shut down. We believed that we had an obligation to keep our doors open and give people a place to come a place of refuge, right? I was called irresponsible. I was called reckless. I was called stupid. I'm a virus spreader. All these things, man. People were just, they weren't happy. And the division in the church keeps going. 
And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, they come out with a vaccine. And now the church is divided over a vaccine. They're divided. I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had this week over the vaccine. Look, I don't care whether you get it or don't get it. I don't care. If you believe, get it. If you don't, don't. I don't care. But the church is digging their heels in. Oh, you, you don't know what you're putting in your body. You don't know this. You don't know that. Listen, we're dividing over a vaccine? More anger, more disagreement, more discord, more division. I mean, it's just unbelievable. People are leaving churches over vaccines. Well, here's what you want, I want you to understand this morning. Somebody's laughing at us this morning. Guess who? Satan. The enemy is laughing at us, church. Listen, one of our spiritual enemy's greatest tasks in life is to divide the body of Christ. If he can divide us, whoo, it's over. Listen, when we work together, we're unstoppable. That's why we have our Gideon brothers and sisters here this morning. We're united. We believe in their work. They believe in the work of the church. They're the evangelistic side, right? They're a tool. They're a tool for us to use in the body of Christ. God uses them on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. I got to figure out somehow that we can get them involved in our toy drives. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But when we're divided, we're weak and ineffective. We're ineffective when we're divided. Now, I don't have power to change much. But I do have some influence into our church family. That's what I do every week is I come up here and I speak to you through the word of God, praying that you're influenced, not by my words, but by the words of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, I am going to give the same passionate, faith-filled appeal that Paul did to the church in Corinth when I share this verse with you. So I want you to stand as I read this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Or, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 10. It reads, and I'm going to read out of the NIV this morning just because I like the way it flowed. Paul writes, I appeal to you. That word appeal means beg, urge, plead. So you can see where Paul's coming from here. Brothers and sisters, that's you and me. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. That verse is powerful. Father, help us to understand what your word has for us today, God. And as we dive into this, le this lesson here, Father, the, I know you taught me through it, God. I just pray that we'd have eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Listen, that word there, when he says no divisions, that word divisions, that word is chisma in the Greek. And what it means, it means a splitting, a division, a chism, a ripping or tearing apart. I was going to do this, but I, I forgot because I'm old. I was going to bring a picture of Jesus up here and tear it in half and say that's what we do. That's what happens when we have division. We tear the body of Christ in half, right? Paul says, man, I, you cannot have divisions. You got to stop. Stop this nonsense. And if Paul's appeal isn't enough, man, well, then let's look at what Jesus has to say, right? It should be in red in your, letter, in your Bibles, all right? So we need to uh, appeal to what he's saying. If you go to John chapter 17, verses 21, 20 through 21 and 23, this is Jesus. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. What? That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, 
May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete what? Unity. Unity. <clears throat> then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So I don't, we should have the words up. So might have a technical glitch here, guys. I'm sorry. Listen, Jesus says here, he says that all of them may be one. Jesus wants us to be one in the body of Christ. Instead of divided and weak, we're, should, we're to be standing united and strong. And here's the thing. We need to be resisting the schemes, attacks, and strategies of the evil one. We need to be helping to usher in God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Didn't Jesus pray that? As in earth, on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus prays here that we may be one, one, united, one mind, one spirit, one heart. Listen, let me ask you a question. What if we could be the generation that becomes the answer to that prayer? What if we can be the answer to the prayer? What if this house right here, the refuge, what if we, this group of people decides, you know what? We're going to be the answer to that prayer. We're going to be one now. We're not playing away. We're not playing games anymore. We're going to be one. We're going to stop tripping over stuff that don't matter. <coughs> well, here's a question I have for you. What will unify the church? What? Now, we know that Jesus is telling us to be one. We know that Paul begged and urged and pleaded for the, the Corinthian church to be one. But what will unify the church? I'm going to give you two things right now. The first is one enemy. And the second, one mission. Perfect timing for you guys to be here today. That's what will unify the church. If we would realize that we have one enemy... Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's our enemy. It's not the person sitting next to you or down the street. Right? Well, that church down there, I don't know about them. They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy, man. Right? Right? Well, they don't read the same version of the Bible that I do. So there's something wrong, right? This is the one true version here. I've heard that for hundred. Goodness gracious. Ah, I don't like the way they do worship. You know, when we lost our drummer and bass player and stuff like that, I thought, gosh, Lord, how can we, how could we, like keep the music enhanced and everything? So I go to the multi-tracks. It's a wonderful system. You put in what you don't have. So we don't have drums, we don't have a bass, we throw it in there. And then once in a while, we throw something else into a choir and stuff like that, you know? But I mean, it's kind of fun. But the team, you know what? Oh my gosh, you, what are you doing when you're not playing live music? We're not? Sure we are, right? You know, put in a subwoofer because that's how the music is, that's got, that's how the music is today. Oh, the subwoofer. There's all this stuff, that, there's always a problem, and, and here's the thing. Why are you coming to church? Are you coming to church for the worship? Or are you coming to hang out with Jesus? I mean, which one is it? Right? The worship, man, yeah, great. Thank you, worship team. But you know what? I could be cool just sitting here and just hanging out with Jesus and being in prayer, man. That person votes differently than me. <laughs> they're the enemy. How can they say they're a Christian if they vote this way? Wow. I don't know. They're a different ethnicity than me. I don't know. They have a different background than me. I don't know. I don't like the music that they listen to. They dress different, right? I mean, don't come out with us to the, to the hood when we're out in the street. We're dressed. We, we're dressed. We're, we're mixing in. We're going, right? They express themselves differently. I don't like the way they're so excited all the time, you know? <laughs> 
I mean, I'm telling you, man, we trip over the dumbest things in the body of Christ. And Jesus has got to be up there and going, oh, my gosh, I don't see anywhere in Scripture. I don't see anywhere where the, where the disciples were, were dividing over the music and stuff. Now, they got into debates about who's going to be the greatest and everything, you know. That's human nature. I get that, right? But come on, man, let's keep it real, church. We have one enemy. The devil, the prince of darkness, father of lies, great deceiver. That's who our enemy is, not your brother and sister in Christ. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, have it full. That's why Jesus came. It's the enemy that wants to kill our churches, destroy our witness and steal our unity. That's what he does. United, we're unstoppable. Divided, we're weak and and ineffective. And our strongest uniting force in the body of Christ is to realize that we have a common enemy that hates our guts and wants to take us out. He wants to take us out. We're a fraternity, church. We're a team. That's what we are. We're team Jesus. That's who we are. We're team Jesus, right? Coach Pops and I, we coached football together and stuff. And I've been, I coached for about 27, 28 years. I finally retired a few years back. But football is a fraternity. Football is a team sport. It's a true team sport. And when there's division on the team, there's a problem. And I remember after we left Vacaville Christian, a couple of years later, we went and coached a team that had not won a game in five years. They were 0-10 for five years. We roll in, we bring our system in, we know our system works, man. We've got a lot of opposition because it's not the traditional system that they've been running, which didn't win them any games, so I don't know why you're tripping, right? (laughs) Right? So we had, and we're team players, so we let some of the guys that were still coaching there, we said, come on, come be a part of what we're doing. But they couldn't buy into what we were doing. They were causing a problem. So much so that our first game, we're out the shoots and we lose this game and we get we get blown out and we're mad because we're like, we're not used to losing. First off, <laughs> I mean, right. Section titles we had coach, all that stuff, man. We're not used to this. Well, we found out that these cats were going behind our backs and 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 coaching things that we weren't teaching. And, and so we, we pull them in and say, hey, look, man, either you're in or you're out. You're in or you're out. Well, they decided they they couldn't fit in, so they were out. We run the table. When nine, nine wins, they did they, they, nine wins. We, we, I mean, we went nine and one. We lost first game, went nine and one, going to the playoffs, and we got beat on a last second hail mary. Right? But listen, when there was division, we weren't winning. But once we figured out what the problem was, and in a sense, they had become the enemy. We singled them out and said, look, either you get in or get out. They got out. Church, man, it's the same way with us. Listen, look around the room. These are your siblings. These are your siblings. Listen, my sister and I, we were we were terrors when we were young. We ran the streets. We were horrible. We would fist fight each other. She's a little teeny thing. My, my wife will tell you, she's a little teeny thing. She's bad. Oh, don't get her upset. She was bad. She, boy, she was no joke, man. That girl, she'd take you out in a minute. And we'd fight all the time. But I'll tell you what, if something was going down with her, whew, it was over. And if something was going down with me, she was with me. And it's like that here, man. We are blood related through the blood of Jesus. Come on now, church. Man, I'm preaching harder than you praise, and I'll tell you that right now. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Listen, we need to unify the church, and we're going to do that by singling out one enemy, just one, Satan, the father of lies. Now, he's real crafty. He's going to try to come at you. He's going to try to shift your thinking on things. But when he does, you have to be a strategist like us. We were like, whoa, something's not right here. We don't normally lose like this. There's got to be an underlying problem here. And you know what? You recognize it's 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 Satan coming at you. And you say, I see what you're doing, man. And you're not going to divide me with my brothers and sisters in Christ. So number one, got to have a common enemy. We do. Number two, you have to have one mission. 
See, we have lost sight of what our mission is. And I'm so thankful that the Gideons are here today because the verse that I'm using for that is Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's our mission. It's not all the extracurricular stuff that we're doing, right? We've been given one task, only one. It's to go reach the lost. To go tell people about Jesus, to share the love of Jesus. One mission, help people know the life-giving love and grace of Jesus Christ. That's it. But sadly, what are we known for today? What are we known for? We're known for our traditions. We're known for our buildings. Ooh, that's a big church. We're known for our style. Ooh, that church has got a certain style, right? We're known for our music. And boy, are we known for what we are against. Boy, are we ever known for what we're against. But let me tell you what we should be known for. We should be known for our love, our grace, our generosity, our justice, and our compassion. What does Micah 6.8 tell us, reading out of the New King James Version here? It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That's what we're called to do. Not fight over the mask, not fight over the vaccine, not fight over this, not fight over that. We are called to do justly. What does that mean? That means to do the right thing. That's what it means. Do the right thing, to love mercy. We're to love mercy. We're not merciful in the body of Christ, man. We don't know what. We have a, a merciful God, a gracious God, and yet we're the most unloving, unmerciful people you can meet. And we're called to walk humbly with your God. You're called to walk humbly with God. The Bible gives us one example, church, right? One example, and only one example, of how the world will know we are followers of Jesus. Only one. And we find that in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the test. That's the test. Did you hear how those Christians forgave? Right? You don't hear that, man. Did you hear how those Christians were bashing everybody and all that? But we don't hear. Do you hear it? Did you, did you hear how those Christians forgave? Did you hear how they're always full of grace? That they stand with the oppressed? That they give to those who are hurting. And they helped me when I couldn't fix my home. They helped me come and fix my house, man. Visited me in prison. Wow, right? And they helped me. They helped tour to my child. See, that's what we should be known for. That's what we should be known for, church. We should be known as the most compassionate, grace-filled, loving, and generous people on earth. That's who we should be. Paul writes to us in Romans chapter 15 here, and I'll be wrapping up in a few seconds. May the God who gives us, excuse me, starting in verse 5, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind, one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Man, that's a, power, that's a powerful set of verses, right? Yeah. I want you to understand something here. That word in verse 7, accept, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a Greek word with a long and very picturesque meaning behind it. The word is pros labano. And this is what it means. To open your arms, to take that person to yourself taking someone by the hand and walking together as companions. That's what it means to accept. That's true acceptance. So how do we accept those who are different? 
right? How do we accept those who are different? Well, we do it simply based on Christ accepting us. How did Jesus accept us? He accepted us while we were still sinners. So where does it start, church? Where does all of this start? It starts with me, and it starts with you. It starts with us, number one, saying we're going to be united. We need to untie the shackles and the things that are holding us back. We need to untie those things from us and let loose of them so that we can be united with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We put barriers up between us, and Jesus says, get rid of them. We need to understand that we have one enemy and one mission. And here's what I want you to understand, okay? And this is something that I want you to grasp from what John was sharing this morning. People are sick and tired of hearing Jesus talk. They want to see Jesus in the flesh. They want to see the real deal. They want to see him. They don't want to hear what we say. They want to see. They want to see our actions. Do our actions line up? with what the word of God says. So let's stop talking and let's start loving, right? Let's grow up. Some of you are so childish in the way you approach everything. It's like, it's amazing to me, man, right? I had to grow up fast. I didn't have my mommy and daddy when I was a teenager. I was living on my own. I was on the streets. I had to grow up quick. Some of you are so immature in how you think. And I'm sorry if that hurts, but it's the truth. You just think like a child still. And I tell people all the time, well, you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years, and you've got, listen, I have maturity in Christ. I had maturity when I was 20. Okay? We need to grow up. We need to, we need to get over our differences. We need to just move past them. Okay? I'll tell you, I don't like the 49ers. <laughs> But I will still love you if you're a 49er fan. It's okay, all right? Stay on that side of the bay. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> See, I'm going to unite with the 49er fan because I love, I, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Listen, we have an enemy, Satan. We have a mission, which is to unleash the love of Jesus on a dying world. We are at war, and it's not at war with the left or the right. Here's the war. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. That's the war. It's not anything else. It's not anything else. Church, we're to unify around Jesus. And let me tell you something. When we do that, here's what happened, right? The love of Jesus, it overcomes hatred, prejudice, and racism. Okay, put that one out there. Man, the unifying power of Jesus breaks the chains of addiction. The unifying power of Jesus, right? The grace of Jesus that he extends upon us, it helps you and I to forgive. And I not only forgive, but to heal broken relationships. See, that's what, we're okay with forgiving. I forgive you. I forgive you, but don't talk to me. Don't you have anything to do with me? That's not forgiveness. That is twisted nonsense. Forgiveness is like I'm forgiving, and now I'm going to heal, and I'm going to get that broken relationship where it needs to be at. It may not be the same, and that's okay, because how it was before wasn't good. And let me tell you something else. Let me tell you what Jesus will do for you if you surrender. He will give you the power, the power to overcome whatever's hitting you. He will. He promises that. Jesus will give to you the the, the healing power in his name, right, to overcome the attacks of the devil. Some of you may not believe this, but Jesus can heal you. Now, thank you for the doctors. I'm thankful for them. But man, I'll tell you what, Jesus can just speak it and it's done. Right? Here's one for everybody in this room. Jesus will free you from the prison of comparison. Yeah, right? And Jesus will calm your anxiety 
and he will relieve you of your deepest fears if you just come to Jesus and say, Lord, I just want all of you. Man, I know what he did for me. I know what he did for me. I know the pit he dug me out of, he drug me out of. The filthy mess I was. Filthy mess I still am, man. Like I tell you all the time, I'm a mess being turned into a message. <laughs> but here's what, here's what the Lord showed me this morning as I was wrapping this thing up. Is that I need to agree on two things. I need to agree that we have one common enemy and nobody else. And that we have one mission. That I'm part of the body of Christ for which Christ died. And the body of Christ is the church, which is us. It's not this building. It's us. It's the body of believers. And I believe this with my whole heart this morning. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. And we can definitely and infinitely do more together than we can apart. One of the lines in the last song we sang was, you are the truth, the life, the way. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. Man, some of you are chasing your feelings all the time, man. You got to stop. Stop with your feelings, man. Our feelings will betray us. Luke, your feelings betray you, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Didn't he say, did Darth Vader say that? I can't remember. Um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, but listen, we cannot be led by our emotions and our feelings. We can't. We can't. We are emotional and we have feelings, but you can't let those rule you. You must let the Spirit of God rule, and the Spirit of God never divides. My prayer this morning is that we would believe what Jesus has told us today and believe what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. That we would allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in our lives and be truly united to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, I just figured out a way to tie food in. Now go, now go break bread and unite. Huh? There you go. Go break bread and unite. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the Gideons coming, man. Just what they represent, the passion they represent, man. Thank you for... Just blessing us, Lord, with Pops and John and Cindy, Lord. And thank you, God, that uh, you have given us the tools we need, Lord, to succeed. And Lord, what a powerful reminder that it's the word of God that changes everything. And Father, we just pray now for the rest of our day, Lord, that we would be consumed by your love. Lord, we would take time to reflect and ask ourselves, have we been dividing? Have we had a divisive nature? And Lord, I can confess to my brothers and sisters that yes, that divisive nature has been in me, and I pray, God, it is not. Amen. And so, Lord, I pray for just abundance today and joy and peace. And I pray, Lord, for our week that we can walk it out Remembering that Matthew 28, 19 is our commission. Thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.